Hello, this is Pastor Rick, and I want to welcome you to the Sunday Forum on this Sunday, October the 17th, where we will now have our fourth episode in our series, our four-point series on wisdom, and we're going to focus in on the book of Job. So I want to encourage you to read that book of Job. I'm sure it's been a while since you read it from beginning to end. I read a famous uh, philosopher uh, the other night who said, yeah, I, wrote, read, I read the book of Job for the first time in many years. And then she paused and said, and God didn't come out too well. <laughs> okay, Job, a tough book, because here we see an innocent man who suffers. And that's uh, the point of the book. How do we live in wisdom when a good people suffer and don't suffer because they've done anything, right? When, when bad things happen to good people. So we want to take a look at this again and remind ourselves on, we've been on a journey concerning wisdom. And as we mentioned last week, each of the books of wisdom, uh, James, right? And then Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and now Job, are all, you might want to say, foils for the book of Deuteronomy. Always think about Deuteronomy because, well, that's how we think. We think, uh, okay, the world is just, the world is fair. That's how God has built it. God has built a world with a mor moral order to it, and that's Deuteronomy. If you do good things, God blesses you. If you do bad things, God punishes you. This is what we teach to children because it's in our own hearts, in our own minds. That's how we think. And then Proverbs comes along and says, uh, live according to wisdom. It's not always as black and white as Deuteronomy. And remember, we had the two wisdom, folly and lady wisdom, all luring us in and saying, come join this way of following the Lord. Either folly, rejecting the Lord actually, or following the Lord. And it's not like God will always bless you, but you place yourself in a position of thriving. Proverbs. And then Ecclesiastes last week, um, the vapor, instead of saying vanity, vanity, all is vanity, or life is meaningless, life is chaotic. Uh, he says he gives this image out of the Hebrew text that life is like a vapor, right, like smoke. And then how do you live when you can't discover the meaning of life? You still live in the fear of the Lord, Ecclesiastes. And now we've got an example. It's almost as if we've gone from the big concept or the big concepts of Proverbs Ecclesiastes to this man, Job. And the book introduces to Job, he is not um, a, a child of Israel. He is not a Jew. Uh, in fact, uh, as you'll see in the video, he's described in rather neutral terms. They don't want us getting caught up in the histrionics of the text or what's behind it. Job is in an essence an every man, right? And every person who's going through uh, these types of trials because this is a universal experience. And so here we have first seen the divine council where God has brought uh, all these powers around and there the, the Satan comes. It's often used with a pronoun because he's the prosecutor. Right? That's the role that he plays. And he comes and tells God, oh, of course, Job is faithful to you because you always reward him. Okay, think Deuteronomy. You always reward him. He's just good because he knows he'll be rewarded for his good actions. But what if you didn't bless him with riches and a strong family and a wonderful career and property and all the other blessings you've given him? Would he still be faithful to you? And so God takes up the bet. And at that point, we're a bit offended, right? I mean, I mean we're reading this, and so we, we recoil. Why would God do this? And, of course, that is the question we have in this text. Is God wise and just? Is God always just? And to be quite honest, that question is never answered here in the book. We never discover really... Uh, why God is doing what God is doing to Job. Uh, the, the whole story goes in another direction. But there you have it. Job loses everything. He first uh, commits to God and says, despite my losses, I will stay uh, faithful uh, to my God. But then he starts to complain, to lament. 
And his friends now enter the scene, particularly three friends. And they're all steeped in Deuteronomy, right? That God is just, the world is just because God is just. And therefore, because God is just in your suffering, so you must have done something wrong. I don't know if you've ever had a friend like that or friends like that, <laughs> that they get together and you feel worse afterwards than before uh, because they say, well, you must be doing something wrong, of course. Or, or sometimes they don't say it, but you can feel it, you can sense it. And especially if you're visiting people who are suffering in the hospital, for example, oh boy, never go down this road. You make, <laughs> you make life worse for them. And that's what happens with Job's friends. And Job, he recoils, he pushes back, he says, no, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. And he maintains his innocence through the whole book. And he's correct. God never says he's guilty of anything here. Uh, but now he's getting angry, and that's this lament tradition where instead of just complaining to your friends about what's happening in life or about what's happening with God, you complain to God. And God actually welcomes this type of direct talk, even though uh, it's difficult. Because Job says, why are you doing these things if you are wise and just? Or are you not wise and just? Are you corrupt? I want you to come and explain yourself. That's what he says to God. You come and explain yourself. And that's when God shows up. And there's two scenes here I want to point to. And the first is God says, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Your perspective, Job, is just on yourself. I'm the creator of the whole universe. And so here he goes into, God goes into this long explanation of I'm maintaining all of order. You know, think of the stars and all the animals. I'm holding this up all by my wisdom. And Job, do you have any concept about the complexity of the world? And of course, the answer to that is no. All you're looking about is yourself. You see a very small uh, a piece of the universe, and I'm maintaining all of it. Now, sometimes when we read that explanation, we still recoil, but this is the argument that God is holding up the whole world. And then he talks about these two animals, Leviathan and Behemoth. We're thinking maybe Behemoth was a hippo, and maybe Leviathan was either a crocodile or a sea creature. But this is a fascinating part of creation, God says. I'm kind of proud of these animals. They are big, but they're not safe. They destroy. They're mean. And I think here God is trying to say part of life is not safe, right? All of life has its behemoths, its leviathans. Uh, that's the way the world has been created. He's even proud of those dimensions of the world, despite the fact that we run into those animals and they create havoc and danger for us and they are not safe, and sometimes they even create death. And there he's saying, that's part of the life, that's part of the creation. And so, Job, I'm the creator of all of it, I have a different perspective than you do, and I've built the world with all these leviathans and behemoths. And now he ends the story in saying, uh, you'll probably never understand my wisdom, but uh, uh, still follow right, in the fear of the Lord. And Job, it's interesting here, God blesses Job and uh, reestablishes his family and his wealth and, and his properties. And it's not like Job says, oh, I've God, I've rewarded Job for good behavior. It's not a reward. It's as if the book ends with God is gracious to Job. Not that Job has earned it or even that God is feeling guilty. God is then gracious again. The question of why is never answered in the book of Job, but rather these things do happen in the world. Bad things do happen to good people. It doesn't mean they're guilty. And yet, how do you proceed? One is, God says, bring your concerns and your laments directly to me and live still in the fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. Job, one of the most famous stories in the Bible, read throughout the world, and now enjoy the video. There are three books in the Bible known as the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. 
The first, Proverbs, showed us that God is wise and just. Yeah, we learned that God has ordered the world so that it's fair. The righteous are rewarded, the wicked are punished. In other words, you get what you deserve. But then we meet Ecclesiastes who observes, well, people don't always get what they deserve. Uh, yeah, he said the world isn't always fair, that life is unpredictable and hard to comprehend, just like smoke. And this makes you wonder, okay, well, is God wise and just? Exactly. And so it's that question that is being explored in the final book of wisdom, Job. All right, let's dive in. So Job begins with a strange story that takes place up in the heavens, which are described something like a heavenly command center. So God is there with these angelic creatures called the sons of God, and they're all there reporting for duty. And God points out this guy Job, his servant, showing how righteous and good he is. And then one of these angelic creatures approaches. He's referred to in Hebrew as the Satan. The Satan? Who is this? Well, this word is actually a title, which literally means the one who is opposed. So out of this whole crew, he is the one questioning how God is running the world. And he proposes that Job might not actually love God, that he's only a good person because God rewards him. If God were to take away all of the good things he gave to Job, then we would see his true colors. So he thinks Job is just working the system? That's exactly right. Maybe he's obeying just to get what he wants. So God agrees to this experiment and allows the Satan to inflict suffering on Job. And Job loses everyone and everything that he cares about. It is devastating. And remember, he deserves none of this. God himself said so. The remarkable thing is that in the midst of all this suffering, Job still praises God. At least for chapters one and two. But then in chapter three, we find out how he's really feeling inside. He unleashes this poem that reveals his devastation. It's a long, elaborate curse on the day that he was born. After this, some of Job's friends come to visit him to offer their help. And all of them are like, Job, you must have done something horribly wrong to deserve this. After all, we know God is just, and we know the world is ordered by God's justice and fairness, so you must be getting what you deserve. And for the next 34 chapters, the friends and Job go back and forth in very dense Hebrew poetry. His friends keep speculating about why God might have sent such suffering, and they even start making up lists of hypothetical sins that Job must have committed. But after each accusation, Job defends his innocence. And Job is innocent. He is. He's also on an emotional roller coaster. At some moments, he's very confident that God is still wise and just. Yeah, in other moments, he's doubting God's goodness. He even comes to accuse God of being reckless, unfair, and corrupt. So by the end of the dialogue, Job demands that God come and explain himself in person. And God does so. He comes in the form of a great storm cloud. Now, God doesn't give Job a direct answer. He doesn't tell Job about the conversation with the Satan. Yeah, he does something very different. He takes Job on a virtual tour of the universe. He shows Job how grand the world is, and he asks him if he's even capable of running it or understanding it just for a day. He shows Job how much detail there is in the world, things that we might see every day but really don't understand at all. But God does. He knows it all intimately. He pays attention to the beauty and operations of the universe in ways that we haven't even imagined and in places that we will never see. Then to conclude, God shows Job two wondrous beasts and brags about how great they are. Yeah, they are dangerous. I mean, they would kill you without even thinking about it. And God says they're not evil. They're actually a part of his good world. And then that's it. That's God's whole defense. It's kind of weird. I mean, what was this all about? It seems to be this. From Job's point of view, it looks like God is not just. But God's perspective is infinitely bigger. He's dynamically interacting with a whole universe of complexity when he makes decisions. And this is what God calls his wisdom. So Job asking God to defend himself is actually kind of absurd. He couldn't comprehend this kind of complexity even if he wanted to. So 
where does this leave us? Well, it leaves Job in a place of humility. He never learned why he suffered, and yet he's able to live in peace and in the fear of the Lord. But that's not where the book ends, because after this, God restores to Job double everything he had lost. And this, again, is surprising. I mean, is this a reward? Is God saying, congratulations, Job, you passed this elaborate test? No. I mean, the whole book just made the point that Job losing everything was not a punishment. And so now getting it back isn't a reward. So why does he get it back? Well, apparently, God, in his wisdom, decided to give Job a gift. We don't know why. But what we do know is that Job is now the kind of person who, no matter what comes, good or bad, he can trust God's wisdom. And that's the book of Job and the end of our wisdom series. These biblical books of wisdom are amazing. Each one offers a unique perspective on the good life, and you need to hear all of them together as you learn to live with wisdom and in the fear of the Lord.